Good evening, everyone. Muy buenas noches. And welcome to Manhattan Neighborhood Network, El Barrio Firehouse Community Media Center. Uh, we are very happy to have all of you here tonight in a special celebration, Puerto Rican Heritage Month. And I am especially pleased because this is a collaboration between Tayel Boricua and MD. I am Senaida Mendez, the director of this beautiful media center. And I want to give my sincere thanks to Marco Dimas and to Nisa Tufino, uh, who are collaborating in this wonderful production tonight. And I also want to make sure to give my sincere thanks to Rani Vigini, who put this panel together. I want to bring Rani to continue the program, and I want you to feel welcome and to enjoy the rest of this evening. Thank you, and good evening again. Buenas noches. We do have a wonderful program planned for you this evening, and we are indeed honored to have these two extraordinary individuals who will share their love of the art of Francisco Oyer. Dr. Yasmin Ramirez will be assisting in their journey. This program was inspired by the painting that you see behind us, The Conversation by Nietzsche Tufino, a tribute to Oyer that depicts a conversation with his artist colleagues, Camille Pizarro, Paul Cezanne, and Claude Monet, along with Pizarro's son, Etienne. I am dedicating tonight's program in loving memory of Fernando Salicru, who is always in our hearts. It is my honor to present Marco Dimas, the executive director of Taller Boricua. Thank you. Good evening. As the executive director of Taller Boricua, I would like to welcome you all to the special event celebrating Puerto Rican Heritage Month with Manhattan Neighborhood Network. This is the first of planned programs that we will be presenting throughout the coming months, highlighting the richness of our Puerto Rican heritage that will include visual arts, film, and poetry. The Yerboricua's history in El Barrio began 45 years ago. And as a founder, I want to especially embrace all the artists and community activists present. In particular, we again, Nitsa Tufino, Rodriguez Colero, Nestor Otero, Jorge Mendoza, Mendocino, and the Prida artists with Luis Caldero Minerva Gonzalez, who's not here today, and Eliezer Berrios. Uh, thank you for coming. Que viva Puerto Rico y nuestra herencia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you. Great job. And now we are going to bring um, Rosa Cruz Cordero from the Puerto Rican Federal Affairs Administration, representing the, direct, the regional director, Brenda Torres. She's going to be presenting a special letter from the Puerto Rican Affairs Office. Thank you, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Dr. Aste. The New York Regional Office of the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration it takes great pride in uh, counting you as a friend and as a partner. We celebrate that as Francisco Yel found his muse in his native island, you were also inspired by our homeland and our masters. We celebrate your hard work and dedication and are proud to call you our adopted son. Dr. Sullivan. We at Prafa congratulate you on the success of your book, From San Juan to Paris and Back, and the exhibit now on view at the Brooklyn Museum. You have achieved in creating a vivid picture for the reader of Oyel and his motherland, Puerto Rico. You have restored the significance of Oyel's work and his influence in shaping our uniquely Caribbean aesthetic. You have described his role in the realism and impressionism movements and has shed light on his place 
as a contemporary of Cezanne and Pizarro. The people of Puerto Rico are applauding you and are honored to also call you our adopted son. We wish you both much success in all of your works. Viva. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jasmine Ramirez, who will moderate this panel or this talk. I don't think so. Thank you. Good evening. Buenas noches. Um, I'm so honored to be here with all of you um, and uh, to introduce uh, my friend and colleague and mentor, Edward Sullivan, a professor of art history at the Institute of Fine Arts, curator of Latin American and Caribbean art in several uh, North and South um, American museums. Uh, that, and Richard Espy, Dr. Richard Espy, uh, who's the curator of European art and managing director of the arts of the Americas and Europe at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, I guess we're gonna begin by just discussing how this extraordinary exhibition began. Well, I first want to say thank you to Yasmin and thank you because I feel as Rich, my great friend and uh, collaborator on this project of Francisco Oyer y su mundo, we are feeling extremely privileged right now to be in this room with all this wonderful artistic energy, including that of founding fathers and mothers or mothers and fathers of uh, Puerto Rican art in New York. And we couldn't be, I couldn't feel more privileged. And also to be called un hijo de Puerto Rico para mí es un honor increíble porque yo llevo muchísimos años viajando a Puerto Rico y pues estudiando y tratando de asimilar mi espíritu dentro del espíritu de la isla. So I'm very happy uh, to receive this honor and I'm sure Rich feels the same way. I do. Don't you? Uh, I do. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Edward and I know each other well. We can almost read each other's thoughts at this point. But um, I had the privilege um, of spending three very important years in Puerto Rico, in Ponce, working at the Museo de Arte de Ponce. And my mother always said, I became a better son because of my three years in Puerto Rico. So I will share with her this honor. And um, I know it'll mean as much to her as it has to me. So the, uh, I think that this, uh, this fall has been so interesting in New York because there has uh, been a great deal of interest in the Caribbean in general, in Puerto Rico, and the work that we were doing for the past three or four years uh, has culminated in an exhibition that I think that the museum is very proud of and I think serves the community or many communities, Caribbean communities, uh, communities of all sorts. We certainly don't want to limit it to one group because it's a, it's a very large uh, project that I think sort of radiates out to people who are interested in art no matter what country or no matter what time period. But Yasmin asked um, how the idea came about and I guess I have to go back to my almost my childhood when I started to travel when I was a teenager to Puerto Rico and by the time I was a graduate student and going to the Museo de Ponce, uh, to look at the European collection, I also there saw the first works of Francisco Oyer, who I had heard of, I knew about him, but my first encounter, I, I'm pretty sure, was at the Museo de Arte de Ponce. Mm. And I was fascinated by this figure who was uh, emerging from a, a very interesting, sophisticated art world, but a very small art world of the 1840s, 1850s in San Juan. Uh, an artist who, when he was very young and studying with a local uh, painter called uh, uh, Noah, Cleto Noah, uh, he said to him, after a couple of months, you have to leave, I can't teach you anymore. And finally, at age 18, he went to Europe. And for the next 20 years, he went back and forth. San Juan, Madrid, Paris, back to the islands, to Cuba on certain occasions. And so I was just fascinated by this peripatetic figure and began to work on him and wrote some essays about him. And ultimately in 2008, I began to think that I really wanted to do a book that had to do with Oyer, his work, and his wider world in the Caribbean. Uh, that happened, it was published last year, actually um, 
There's a copy of it right here. Uh, it's a book that gave birth to the exhibition. It's called From San Juan to Paris and Back, uh, Francisco Oyer and the Caribbean Art in the Era of Impressionism. Uh, halfway through writing it, I thought, this art is so wonderful, the public has to see it again in New York. It hadn't been seen since the 1980s. I approached the director, then director, Arnold Lehman, uh, recently retired at Brooklyn Museum, who very graciously became enthusiastic and said, yes, you have to work with our curator, Rich Asti. We already knew each other, so it was a perfect match. And then we went off to San Juan and started preparing. We did. And um, Francisco Oyer, when Edward approached me, was a very easy sell because, as I mentioned, I had already lived in Puerto Rico for three years. I had just joined the Brooklyn Museum. This is 2010. And I, too, discovered Oyer in Puerto Rico. Like Edward, my, my training is in European painting and sculpture. And the Ponce Museum has a wonderful collection, much to my surprise until I moved there, of European old masters. But they were also collecting, as early as the late 50s and 60s, the art of Puerto Rican masters, including Francisco Oyer and Jose Campeche. So I discovered them while there. And then after my three years ended in Puerto Rico, I brought my love of these new artists, or at least new to me, with me to Brooklyn. And I it made it almost my mission to educate our internal community at the Brooklyn Museum about the riches of Puerto Rico, in particular in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so the, the groundwork was already set when Edward approached us in 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. to um, collaborate on this, on this exhibition. It made a lot of sense for Brooklyn. By then, we were already acquiring great works by uh, Francisco Oyer, but also by Jose Campeche. And I was in the process, and I'm doing a little bit of, of uh, showing off myself, uh, of working on an exhibition that opened at the Brooklyn Museum in 2013 called Behind Closed Doors, Art in the Spanish-American Home. And I highlight the book because the cover of this exhibition uh, is a portrait that we had acquired by Jose Campeche. So we really wanted the face of the show to be the face of Puerto Rico, and the face of Puerto Rico in a surprising moment where art was flourishing in the late 18th century. Uh, and then um, Edward was already a friend, as he mentioned. Um, he was an advisor on this exhibition. Uh, I'm a bad Peruvian. I knew very little about my own um, region of origin. And so this exhibition was a, a very biographical journey. And Edward was a, a wonderful support through that show. And we wanted to end that show in 20. 13 with Francisco Oyer. And we really wanted to remind visitors in a colonial context that Puerto Rico was still colonial, like Cuba, in the Caribbean through 1898. And so we, I always envisioned working on that show with Edward as an advisor um, that our current show would be the next step, the sequel. And I think we've succeeded. Yeah. So I have a small question about Oyer and Campeche, because growing up, learning about art, hist art history on the island, you can practically never talk about Oyel without mentioning Campeche. Mm. We have um, galleries that have been named the Oyel Campeche Gallery, both in Puerto Rico and here. What are some of the parallels, but also differences between these two artists, besides, of course, the, the eras, the different eras that they lived in? I think one of the things that, that unites them is their, their, their rootedness on the island. They are both artists who come out of a multitude of traditions. Of course, uh, Campeche, who was a, an Afro-Puerto Rican artist who was trained in the island. He did not leave, but he was trained by a Span partly by Spanish artist uh, Luis Paret y Alcázar, who had come in the 18th century to Puerto Rico to spend several years. Actually, he was exiled from the royal court in Spain. And his exile, which maybe to him was a bad thing, to me it would be heavenly to go to spend several years in Puerto Rico, <laughs> but he trained Campeche. And uh, Oyer, a hundred years later, more or less, also has a European training, which he received on site. So I think it is that sort of nurturing of art on both sides of the Atlantic that was very important for both of them. And ultimately, uh, uh, the artist uh, Oyer would say things. I mean, he would write about, and others would write about him as the successor to the great uh, to the um, sort of foundational current that Campeche had already established in Puerto Rico and followed up by Oyer as the second step in the modernization process of the uh, art of the island. Um, uh, to your point about, to your question about the differences, 
what always struck me is how religious the, the majority of Campeche's paintings were. And for that reason, and, and that Oyer's paintings tend to be more secular. And Oyer is a very self-identified realist painter, painting his moment, his era, his epoch, what he sees, something he um, uh, embraces in Puerto Rico, but really um, has uh, uh, affirmed when he's in Paris with the artists that he's working with in the 1850s and 60s in particular. And so um, the subject matter was of interest to me, the, the, the difference in their choice of subject matter. What I love that they have in common is their interest in portraiture. And the very earliest paintings by Oyer are actually copies of portraits by Campeche. And um, we, for that reason, wanted to begin the exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum with portraits by Campeche um, to show the, the true source of inspiration early on for the young Oyer in the 1840s. I thought there weren't any museums in Puerto Rico uh, in the 19th century. No, there weren't. Actually, the first museum or the first institution that you could call a, muse a museum was the Ateneo. And of course, that was founded during uh, Oyer's lifetime. But as a young man, he would have seen uh, Campeches in churches, in religious institutions, because uh, Campeche was very prolific. And he painted not only in San Juan, but he painted in Cuamo, and he painted in various other towns around the island. And so he was familiar with them. And actually, he even intervened in repainting certain pictures of Campeche that had become damaged in some of the, of the local churches. So he actually sort of fixed up some of the uh, Oyer <laughs> painting, I mean, some of the Campeche paintings. Uh, so he was sort of deeply immersed in that colonial style, uh, not only of Campeche, but other artists who would come to the island. So that's how he would have seen them. There's one example that was also in his own family's collection because there was a Campeche right. portrait of Oyer's grandfather, also named Francisco Oyer. So a personal connection. There Absolutely. Was, definitely. Yes, and the grandfather was a very interesting figure of the grandfather of Oyer because uh, he came from Spain, from uh, Catalonia, and uh, he was a very well-known physician, a medical doctor. And he uh, is credited with saving the island, saving Puerto Rico, from a wave of, I think it was yellow fever. And he had invented a, a vaccine uh, against this disease and was a very important figure in the medical profession in Puerto Rico uh, in the very late 18th, early 19th century. Um, Oyer's mother, on the other hand, was from a, a, a Spanish family who had come much, much earlier uh, to the island, actually from the Canaries. So it's a, ca a familia Canaria y Catalun a Catalana, and they came together in, in Puerto Rico. So, so um, I think one of the things that fascinates us as an audience is to know some rich details about Oyer's time in Paris and his, his relationships with these other artists and um, how we can see them in, in the paintings on view. Can you tell us a couple of about a couple of paintings where we would really see that interaction between himself and Pizarro, for example? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm thinking of the, a very late painting on loan, a French landscape from 1895 by Oyer that opens up the section on Oyer's France. We pair it in the show at the Brooklyn Museum with the painting, a, a contemporary work by Claude Monet. But, um, it's very closely looking at Pizarro. And it was painted when Oyer travels to France for the very last time to accompany the wake, El Velorio, for um, a showing at the Paris Salon. And while there, he visits Pizarro in the countryside outside of Paris. And they're both painting the same subject matter. They're both painting women tending geese uh, with children. The, the compositions are very similar with sloping hills, very dramatic perspectives. And if I didn't tell you that the Oyer painting was painted by a Puerto Rican, you would believe that it was a French artist behind that work. Although I'm very interested in your mentioning Pizarro because it's really a key link between, uh, between Oyer and Europe. And I think it's important to understand that Francisco Oyer is not an artist who is interested in copying or just simply being yet another impressionist. He is someone who has a very, very active imagination 
He doesn't, uh, he, he is within the realm of all these famous people when he goes as a young man to Paris, having first studied in Madrid. That was the f logical first step for most artists from Latin America or the Caribbean, uh, from Spanish-speaking countries, to study art at the Royal Academy in Madrid. But Paris, he, I think, develops a sort of particular affinity for. And the person who I'm sure was his closest friend was Pizarro. And why? So Pizarro, you know, very important artist, very interesting artist, probably a very gregarious figure, but he, like Oyer, was from the Caribbean. And he was born in the, on the island of St. Thomas. St. Thomas was, at that time, it's now the U.S. Virgin Islands, then it was the Danish Virgin Islands. Uh, Pizarro always considered himself Caribbean. He never gave up his Danish citizenship. And I think he and Oyer bonded because of their outsiderness. Uh, Pizarro was not only Caribbean, he was Jewish. And he had come from a Jewish-French family who had emigrated to the Caribbean the previous generation. So they sort of bonded together as friends and as soulmates. And, uh, and Oyer uh, was interested in his way of painting, his interest in light and air and so on and so forth. But he, never, he was never a slavish copyist. And we don't, I think in the exhibition, it's quite clear that you know, we're, we're painting, we're putting 40 or so paintings by Oyer in juxtaposition with, Manet, with Monet and with Kayabut and with American artists like Frederick Church. And I think we can see quite clearly how uh, Oyer developed looking at assimilating and then rejecting and reconfiguring his own work. So he is somebody who has a lot of inspiration, a lot of experience, but was very conscious of making his own mark. And that mark was no more uh, present than when he goes back to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. because it's his Puerto Rican pictures that are, I think, the most outstanding works. Without a doubt, and that's exactly why we close the show with Oyer's Puerto Rico, where he really hits his stride after 20 plus years in France and in Spain. And what he does with those influences, those European influences, when he applies them to Puerto Rican people and places and things, is what really identifies him as an individual artist. Yeah. So, Can you tell us a little bit about the transition um, into realism? Because it's almost like he went backwards if we were to take that whole idea about modernism, impressionism. He did not necessarily become a post-impressionist, or did he? Maybe you can. Uh, you answer that. We, we both have very strong feelings about this. <laughs> about post-impressionism? Okay. No, 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 about the whole development of Oyer. Okay. And it's complicated. I would love to pin him down as someone who followed a very clear trajectory. And as someone trained in a very traditional way in art history, you love when works and artists stay within the confines of a moment in time. And Oyer, as you said, is kind of slippery. Uh, he but will, in a good way. In a very good way. Uh, he'll, he'll mix different modes, sometimes within the same composition. So his most famous work, uh, The Wake or El Velorio, has details that you mentioned being realist inspired. Uh, Gustave Courbet is clearly the source for this large masterpiece. Mm -hmm. But if you look through the windows um, um, outside of the Bohio and you see a view of the landscape in the distance, that's him at his most impressionistic, where he's really careful with the light effects and capturing those precise moments in a time of day. So he's tricky. Um, it, as Edward says in a good way, he has many options. And I think that the distance, the uh, distance uh, created by the Atlantic Ocean between the old world and the new allows him to really process these influences in different ways. And one thing that some people don't, or many people don't really remark on is that he was also affected by photography. Mm. And there's one extraordinary picture that is a painting that most people thought was long lost, a portrait of William McKinley, the president of the United States when the invasion of the American troops happened at the time of the Spanish-American War, July 1898. Uh, he, Oyer is a very interesting portraitist. Mostly we think about El Velorio, we think about his gorgeous landscapes of the island and his still lifes. But he was also very important as a political figure. He had been named a, as a official court portrait to the Spanish king. And then he did many official portraits in Puerto Rico of, of significant political and literary figures. And then when the political climate changed, the war came, uh, Puerto Rico becomes an American colony, and uh, he is trying to figure out how am I, as an official Spanish portraitist, going to function in this new political reality. 
He gets, a port, he gets a photograph from a book that had been published just after the war, just after the Spanish-American War, called Our, something like Our New Neighbors, a sort of very triumphalist book published by uh, various authors in New York about the new America in Cuba and the Philippines and, uh, and Puerto Rico. And in the back of the book is a painting, or rather a photograph, of McKinley, and he uses that as a basis for, for a portrait that he paints in 1898, October 1898. He sends it off to Washington. He's never been to Washington. He doesn't know McKinley, but he wants, obviously, to get a job as mm. the American version of what he had done for the Spanish king. So he sends off this picture, rather stiff portrait, I must say, uh, because usually portraits based on photographs, whether they be of animals or people, are a little stiff. Uh, but um, he sends it off. It's an interesting story, and it never arrives at its destination. We know that there's no reference to this picture in the White House archives, and only in the 19, around 1980s, it surfaced at a garage sale in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C., out of nowhere. And somebody bought it. It went back into a private collection, disappeared for 20 years, and then resurfaced. It's now in a uh, private collection in Ponce, and the uh, owners kindly lent it to our show. So he is a realist, he is an impressionist, he is a naturalist, he paints from photography, he does a little bit of everything. So, Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And maybe you could squeeze in post-impressionist. There are moments yeah, where the yes. brush work, uh -huh. at least on a formal level. Yes. But I think socially, he's such a socially conscious artist, and what I'm getting the, the more I'm discovering him is that he is very committed to employing his art form to advance society. And when I give tours of the exhibition, I often wonder myself why he's not engaging in the formal experiments of his colleagues in Paris, why he's not taking certain, um, certain formal risks that you find with Pizarro, with Cezanne. These are proto-impressionists. These are artists by the 1890s who are really shattering the illusion of space and depth. And these are the artists who will really pave the way for Picasso and Brock in the 20th century. Oyer doesn't do that. And um, I think because of the social agenda behind so much of his artwork uh, and the cause he's always fighting for back in Puerto Rico, his beloved Puerto Rico, whether it's social justice or the end of a colonial system that isn't supporting the educational system of his island or the, um, the, the, the enslaved population that only realizes emancipation in 1873, he realizes, I think, that with formal experiments, he's not going to be as effective as a painter. And so his language, his pictorial language, has to be effective and clear. And, Painting like a realist is an effective idiom. So who were his painters? How did, how did he make his living in Puerto Rico, given that there really weren't art schools? Mm. And overall, it was a poor island. Who were his patrons? He didn't make a very good living. <laughs> he was not a rich artist. And people always ask me that, I mean, about his patrons. And also, wasn't he, because he's famous today, he's certainly famous in Puerto Rico, wasn't he a very successful artist? But you bring up a very important fact that there was a very tiny, if almost non-existent, art world in Puerto Rico. So mainly, I think his patrons were the people, his friends, people who owned, say, sugar plantations where he would often spend several months uh, living in different parts of the island. He would then give them works of art uh, in exchange for their hospitality. So that's one thing. He had at certain times worked for churches because before he became rather anti-clerical because the later part of his life was a very anti-clerical uh, time, but he had been in his youth an altar boy, like I was <laughs> in, one, in my own youth. He was very much uh, trained as a very young boy in painting religious subjects, and so the church entered into this a little bit. Uh, I think he really counted on his, um, on his Spanish and uh, particularly Spanish contacts uh, for some paintings, some official pictures. He did a very important battle picture, which we have in the exhibition, uh, one version of which is in the Royal Palace in Madrid. But, you know, in general, he was not an artist who made uh, he didn't, there were no galleries, mm -hmm. uh, there were very few exhibitions, and the exhibitions that were in Puerto Rico at the time were not sale exhibitions. So I guess the most money he would have made would have been from his portraits of the governors and other military figures. He also had um, one exceptional 
commission in the 1890s from the Athenaeum in Puerto Rico to paint a series of illustrious portraits of great men of Puerto Rican history. Mm -hmm. But this is very late in his career. By then, he's already an established artist. He's taken almost all of his trips to Europe, and um, that was not a reliable source of income for him. I want to actually take up on that subject because it's such an important one, the Galeria de Puerto Ricanos Ilustres. Uh, that was actually not a series made for one place. I don't think that there was actually a gallery, but it was a series of pictures done over a number of years of famous, m almost all male, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Puerto Rican uh, figures in the arts and in the um, military and in the various worlds of culture. Uh, and for me, the most touching and beautiful one of these pictures, some of which are very formal, a little sometimes a little stiff, others very, very human, uh, is a painting very well known of uh, Rafael Cordero, called yeah. Maestro Rafael Cordero, who was an immensely important figure within the history of Puerto Rican culture. Uh, we have the painting in the Brooklyn Museum exhibition. I still don't believe happily. that we have the painting. We it's almost <laughs> didn't get it. We had to go and beg. Uh, we had to do this on a number of occasions and go and have dinners with and cajole and be nice to, not that we wouldn't be nice anyway, but be super nice to people who own these pictures, both private uh, collectors as well as public institutions. And happily, we got most of what we asked for. And one of our most happy moments was when we were able to um, have the assurance of having the Maestro Rafael Cordero picture there. So uh, Cordero, part of this series of illustrious Puerto Ricans, was, as, as many of you in this audience know, the founder of the first school for enslaved children, first boys of, um, boys of color, and later he opened it up to all social levels. And this idea of education was not only in the context of this picture, but in the context of the life of Francisco Yer was immensely important. He didn't make money from his educational undertakings. He opened 10 schools of art and 10 schools of drawing, some of which were free, some of which were for women. Uh, and But many of them closed after a short amount of time because they didn't get more government support that they needed. But he was constantly aware of the need for a new nation to have a new start in terms of uh, education and pedagogy. And so, as you mentioned, uh, in the Velorio, mm -hmm. that is, uh, a sense, in a sense, a critique of the very late colonial <laughs> neglect of Puerto Rico on the part of Spain. Uh, uh, and that has to do with illiteracy as well. The, illiter the illiteracy rate was very high uh, at the time that uh, Oguer lived, but also in this beautiful, very noble portrait of this Afro-Puerto Rican man, uh, Cordero. It is also a, a, a homage to the importance of teaching, teaching, learning, and the embodiment of the nation, literally the body of the nation, children who are very dark, children of mixed race, white children, the black teacher. It's all about uh, the, the mixing of race, the importance of promoting educational values to every aspect of society, and I think it is one of his greatest uh, achievements. That speaks to many different kinds of um, issues that we're yes. dealing with right now, and um, particularly among the diaspora, this depiction, right, of of the multi complexions right. of Latinos of Puerto Ricans, which has always been a little bit bothersome uh, sure. to certain sectors of American society. But I mm -hmm. I want to go back to this issue of pedagogy, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about who were his students and would we know uh, any of Oyer's artistic students today? Yes. Well, why don't you start by, by saying a little bit about them. It's a great question because there were many of them, but very few known. Sure, and we're lucky to have one self-portrait in the exhibition of one of his very first students from 1868, a self-portrait by Pio Casimiro Basener who was a student of his in his very first school, which he opened in San Juan that year, 1868. And um, it's a loan from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And it, he happens to be a man who was actually born enslaved and acquired his freedom through his career. 
through his painting practice. He was able to purchase his freedom. And when you see the exhibition, you find a self-portrait very formally dressed um, after he had acquired his freedom. And we're very lucky to pair that self-portrait with a work by that artist. And uh, nearby is a work by the master, by um, Francisco Oyer. The same subject, it's in a series of paintings of sugar plantations, and we, we pair master and student side by side. So um, we discuss very briefly in that moment Oyer as a teacher. And in the exhibition, we also punc um, punctuate the show with timelines throughout his career where we try to cite the many art schools, 10 in total, I believe, that he opened throughout his long career. And, um, and we highlight one of the very early students with that moment in the sugar plantations. Yeah. So we know he had many students uh, because we have records of the, of the classes he taught. Um, many of the women or the girls that he taught, almost certainly, none of whom, their names are, their, uh, almost no names really survive beyond the names on paper. We don't have works of them. Uh, and that's very likely because they ultimately got married, had children, had to give up their careers or their would-be careers in art. I mean, that's a, a very old story about the history of women artists. Uh, there was actually one other name called Manuel Jordan, who, mm. if you know the history of Puerto Rican art in the late years of the 19th century, his name is there. I mean, he's a very creditable painter. Uh, but he didn't produce famous artists directly out of his studio. However, the, the story continues, and it continues in the first years of the 20th century when Oyer's fame uh, continues. I mean, Oyer died in 1917, and his work was very well known. So mm -hmm. artists like Ramon Frade and uh, Poe, was from Ponce was all were also artists who felt a uh, who felt a very much of an inspiration from Moyer. So then uh, it was a number of years until there was a major Oyer show in, in the island, in San Juan. 19, the late 1940s was a major turning point. Mm -hmm. And then later there were other exhibitions in Puerto Rico and ultimately the exhibition that traveled from Puerto Rico to New York in 1983 that was shown at El Museo. And that was the beginning of a knowledge on the part of US audiences of Francisco Oyer. But the island continues, and actually in the book, which the, the book was written not as a catalog for an exhibition, it was really a totally separate project, but merged with our exhibition project. And the end of that book is a chapter about contemporary artists in Puerto Rico. There are many artists in the diaspora, such as Nietzsche Tufino, many, many other people. Uh, um, Pepon Osorio, I could mm. list, you know, a whole list of very distinguished artists who either do variations of uh, or are inspired by, uh, by Oyer. So in a sense, Oyer's pedagogy has a, a life after the life uh, that he lived on earth and is continuing to nurture uh, highly distinguished artists in this island, on the island, and uh, throughout the, wherever Puerto Rican artists are, they're thinking about Francisco Oyer. I would, I think that's a fair statement. And questions right now? That would be fine. I think it would sure. be, you know. Does anyone have uh, some interjections? Forget the lights over there and start looking at the whole story or the whole painting, how it's shot and everything. Say, oh my God, look at these wonderful paintings. I'm not in Ponce. You know? I found it so fascinating, you know, the way the stone comes out just to look at that painting. Mm. Then I saw the show over there in 1983 when I came to New York and went back and saw how hard, you know, De Venegas and Manuel Benitez worked on that story. That and I found very interesting, but then I went to Paris uh, later on, and I saw the exhibition of the Ortega School, but in a portrait time, Vincent Van Gogh, Prince of the Ortega School. I said, oh my, and then I, I looked at the, the, the mirror, the painting of the Sublime there, and I looked at the letter written by, by Francisco Oyer, 
with the daughter who was supposed to have kids, they got kids, and she passed, and, and those, oh my God, it, he wasn't just a, 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 a Christian, he was like the spiritual master. He, I connect that a school uh, through Gustav Silvey, the realism or all the philosophical scholars, more like the, um, the, 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 the romantic school, really, because it was more in the social and political issues. You know, and then, uh, that to connect that school and look for all that movement, and somehow that project the idea uh, uh, that was, and somehow that connect the evolution of painting through the learning of Silvey. And then I said, oh my God, you see the who bad paintings. I went to the Museo of Tech because most of the painting of, 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 of Francisco Riera are in the, in the storage car, warehouse of the, of the Ocean Museum. So I said, well, let me go and look at the who bad painting. And I look at the gray skin and all that stuff that is Spanish. So when I look at the Velorio, he discovered something there. Discovered his roots, discovered the windows, discovered the, the door and the new, the new landscape. But also the political statement he wanted to make. So when you look, for example, in the cafes in Paris with the great uh, politician of Puerto Rico, the great master, Betanza, uh, 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 Morena Tello Betanza, he meets over there to organize the revolution of Puerto Rico. He is there. Oye was in Puerto Rico, he was there. You know, it's very interesting because when it just uh, had the guts to paint these paintings here at that moment in time, and based on the bourgeoisie of, the, of Puerto Rico, the Japan was in just success, but also the house, the Serralier house, invited him to go over there to paint La Ceiba. When you look at La Ceiba, you look at the, the Madama painting over there, the Madame was in clothes over there, you see? So it's a lot of, the, all, these, all these houses invited him because it was part of the bourgeoisie. So, but at the same time, was another issue that found resonance to the point that you see was he was making painting for Pizarro so Pizarro can help him in some financially. Uh, so he signed uh, uh, Oye and Pizarro erased over and signed and sign Pizarro. Most of the paintings are in the museum now and the point that you see is not making a discovery anymore. Is that, is, have you heard of this? No. no may just I ask you about though one thing um, you that, that, you, that you bring up? Oh, oh you know one thing? We hear it, yes, and oh, we're oh, very yeah, fascinated by your comment. The well, anyhow, let's see. For me, it's that the, 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 the value of Francisco Lier that they demolished, they demolished, they demolished Can you the hear history, it? is because of the colonial system. Okay. How is an artist like Francisco Lier that it has so much power mm -hmm. in Paris, some of the museums that you see over there, some of them have in the, in the storage and the warehouse Pizarro can be there, and other artists can be there, but was friends, and they share all the ideas. That's what I want to say. Okay. Actually, I think it does bring up some questions, mm -hmm. just general Absolutely. questions, about why did, why did he return to Puerto Rico? What were some of his reasons for returning? Francisco Yer could not stay away. He was somebody who was literally uh, conflicted. I think that he was an artist who had very much of a, uh, a, a good relationship with his contemporaries in Paris, but he was so both socially and psychologically connected to the place where he grew up that he, I don't think that he could realize his dreams of being a fulfilled artist in a place that was not Puerto Rico. So, uh, and I think that in a way you can see this, you can almost read this in his uh, canvases, the ones that he did in France are extremely accomplished they're very much a part of this sort of international realism, impressionism, post-impressionism movement. But it is, as we both commented a little while ago, the ones that really have the heart and soul of this artist are the ones that he did on the island. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, why he comes back also for our, could be very personal reasons. His wife is home uh, in Puerto Rico. He has two daughters back in Puerto Rico, uh, and he. Uh, leaves them for four different occasions, sometimes for as long as seven or eight years. Um, and that, that's significant at the time, it was a long crossing. 
But um, I think he realized, even in, during his career, that he's at his best when he's painting what he knows best. And what he knows best is Puerto Rico. And what other artists um, from the Caribbean, or really from, from around the world, do you think have some parallels with this kind of sentiment that it's better, that, that they're really only truly their best at home? Which are some of the other artists that we can relate or yell to in that kind of sentiment? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just saw the MoMA show on uh, Joaquin Torres Garcia from Uruguay, uh, who uh, begins a little later his transatlantic crossing. He, he goes to um, Barcelona instead of Paris um, early, though he goes in the 1890s, uh, when Oyer was crossing as early as the 1850s. And, I'm, and he was as peripatetic as Oyer, not only living in Barcelona, but also Paris, New York. But when he really takes these formal risks that have established him within the trajectory of art history, it's when he's back in Puerto Rico, uh, in um, Uruguay. So uh, seeing that show, it's much later. I was constantly drawing parallels with Oyer and his his life. I also think of earlier artists. For example, the Hudson River School artists from the United States, many of whom went to study in Germany or in England or elsewhere in Europe but it is really their landscapes of New York or mm -hmm. the, the Northeast. In some cases, they travel out West. Uh, that is their home, and that is their, uh, I think that it, it is the place where their art was most perfectly realized. And so the, this brings up the question of where is home, and does that really figure into one's artistic uh, spirit? And uh, can, you, can an artist only make work that has to do with one place. I mean, mm. it's, I'm opening up a question here, okay. and not a question that we're going to solve tonight. But uh, yes, <laughs> what, what we would like is for you to make reference to the wonderful uh, slide presentation, the PowerPoint for our viewing audience. Oh, sure. All right. And then sure. we will continue with um, questions and answers after they complete this. And we ask that our audience in here in the studio utilize our microphone. Thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, I don't know if we can hold this slide right now, but this is the first Caribbean, colonial Caribbean work that the Brooklyn Museum acquired in 2010 and really inspired us to continue focusing on the basin as a source of artistic production in the 18th and 19th centuries. Another recent acquisition for the Brooklyn Museum, we have our one and only cast painting, or casta, from Mexico from the early part of the 18th century, showing the racial mixing and the reduction of people to types, to things, a scientific approach in the age of the Enlightenment um, to um, uh, people, places, and things. And then. We um, show here where I wish we were right now, San Juan, uh, uh, Oyer's uh, hometown, uh, and uh, the point of view of the colonial center, which in Oyer's day always surprises me. It was only about 18,000 people in the colonial Impressive. capital. And here we show Campeche, a, a copy of a lost self-portrait by Campeche on the right next to the European artist who inspired him and transformed his art, uh, the court painter Luis Perret, who Edward had mentioned earlier, had spent three years in exile in Puerto Rico uh, because he was the source of a scandal. And then we have in the exhibition a number of early paintings by Pizarro, painting in Paris but remembering what he had lived in uh, St. Thomas. And uh, sort of these are almost dreamlike evocations of what he had left uh, in the Caribbean. So that that is something that I think were a uh, very interesting uh, in, in the exhibition, making uh, the, the relationship between young Pizarro and then Pizarro working in the 1860s, 1870s, 80s, when he is uh, uh, making friends with and having a real uh, important impact, I think, uh, a mutual impact on the work of, uh, of uh, Oyer. Oyer's Spain, we have uh, his very, very first work that we know of, a young a, a woman bullfighter, a picture that to a certain extent evokes what he must have seen in Spain, that is this, uh, the work of Francisco Goya, because Goya's uh, paintings were shown at the place where Oyer studied, the academy. And it was also for the Spanish royal family, 
that he painted this major battle picture. This version of it is in the Museum at Ponce that lent it to us. Uh, as I said earlier, there is another version of the same Battle of Trevino, one of the of battles of the Carlist uh, wars, the civil wars that raged in Spain at certain times of the 19th century, uh, and also pictures that in the Brooklyn Museum, we have some of the work by contemporaries, Spanish contemporaries, of, uh, of Oyer, whose work he would have known, such as the Catalan painter uh, uh, Mariano Fortuny and uh, a number of, other, uh, of others. And uh, some of these portraits, we talked about military portraits. Here's a very good example of the official Francisco Oyer painting uh, in a military mode that he also did in Spain as well as in Puerto Rico. One of four major loans from the Ponce Art Museum. So we have to really commend our, our supporters in Puerto Rico for being so generous with their loans. This painting by Corbet is not in the exhibition, uh, but we've been using it as in uh, presentations because it was shown uh, to the Paris public for the first time a year before Oyer arrives in Paris. So this was avant-garde painting in France, very controversial in its day for women uh, prostitutes taking a break from their, their daily chores. Uh, and we also have many landscape artists in the show uh, who inspired Oyer, his contemporaries, the great Daubigny we show here, famous for painting from a floating studio. He and later Monet will actually paint from within their compositions. A major inspiration for Oyer is Jean-Francois Millet and his peasant paintings equally controversial works because at the time they were painted in Paris there were peasant uprisings in the countryside and painting on this scale and giving so much of a composition to a very underrepresented figure was, um, was considered inciting uh, for these revolts. And then a, a wonderful discovery a few years ago in the market, now with a, a private collector in Puerto Rico, proof that Oyer and Cezanne were friends. Here's Oyer painting Cezanne, painting outdoors at a time when they actually shared an apartment in Paris, but spent some time in the countryside preparing works to submit to the Paris Salon. They, like uh, we show here, Pizarro would submit at the 1865 Paris Salon. This is the painting that Pizarro himself actually showed at that salon. Oyer shows four different times at the Paris Salon, Pizarro four different times, Cezanne only once. So it's wonderful to share the, that, that story, please. And here is our one loan that we got from Paris, one of his paintings fairly early, uh, and that is in the Musée d'Orsay. It used to be owned by the doctor, Dr. Gachet, who was a great collector. He was a medical doctor, and among other of his patients was Van Gogh. Uh, here is a photograph that includes Oyer and his Parisian friends, which, if you can see in the background, uh, the wonderful painting by uh, one of our guests this evening, very honored guest, Nitsa Trufino, uh, who has taken an inspiration uh, from this photograph, and thus the life of Oyer continues. And uh, here's a very interesting comparison of a, a work that we would love to have received from the show uh, for the exhibition, but it is on view in an exhibition at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. So Oyer is in New York, Oyer is in Puerto Rico, and he's in the Middle East as well. This picture that's in the <laughs> collection of the Musée d'Orsay. And um, uh, landscapes abound. Actually, he was uh, in his youth or young period in uh, France, might have actually even taken a pilgrimage to, uh, to Lourdes, where he, Our Lady of Lourdes, the, the um, uh, miraculous vision of the Virgin, uh, had happened. But he did these landscapes. You mentioned the French landscape. Here it is. Yeah, this is the great formal comparison where you see them really looking at, at each other, Oyer on the left and Pizarro on the right. 1893, 95, 96, in that last trip to France for Oyer. Same subject matter, same way of, of laying out a composition with a sloping hillside. And then this is the comparison you're going to see when you come to the Brooklyn Museum before the show closes on January 3rd uh, between Oyer on the left and Monet on the right. Paintings that are separated by only a year. Uh, similar brushwork, different approach to landscape. So Edward and I are very transparent in the show in talking about how these artists are similar and how they take very different directions. And, and here are two Oyers in the, um, in the later period on the left, uh, alone from the Ponce Museum, the silk cotton tree from Ponce, La Ceiba. And on the right, 
to anchor us in the Caribbean, a royal palm tree painted by Oyer in 1895. I had a visitor from Jamaica recently come to the exhibition and um, enjoy that painting above every, any other. Excuse me just for one minute because we're running out of time. Sure. Can you please tell our audience the hours of the museum and um, some, maybe some upcoming events that they might be able to attend. Absolutely. So we're open every day but Mondays and Tuesdays, and we're open from 11 in the morning through 6 p.m. Our late nights are Thursday nights when we're open through 10 p.m. And the next major event inspired by the exhibition is on December 12th. And um, uh, we will all be there together uh, in a session that uh, celebrates Oyer's legacy today with contemporary artists in, in dialogue with Oyer and his work. We mentioned Pepon Osorio and Miguel, Miguel Luciano, uh, Osiris, um, please. Marimata O'Neill will be there, yeah. yes. Juan Sanchez Juan will Sanchez. be there. So I, I, I would just like to say one more thing about the overall picture of the show, and that is it, it opens up, I think, for, uh, it, it opens up the Puerto Rican art world and connects it uh, to the rest of the world and the rest of the world to Puerto Rico. So this is really some, I think our work was to look at the broadest possible view of this artist as a central figure within the history of Western art uh, of the 19th and early 20th century. And uh, I would love for you to end with some <laughs> words about El Tenorio, please. Sure. So uh, this is his masterpiece, and you're seeing the beautiful oil sketches by Oyer that are in the exhibition. Uh, we show the creative process through four of his paintings, all in, um, in public and private collections. So um, you won't see El Velorio at the museum because it is an icon of Puerto Rico, and it's used to very good effect uh, locally within the island as a teaching tool by the University of Puerto Rico's Art Museum and its director and curators. So you won't find it there. We of course we wanted it and we asked for we it. We did. We, we had did. to ask for it and they very kindly explained that no we could not have it because it is used as the central image in a very important gallery, a teaching gallery of material, historical, and artistic culture of the island. So we understood that very well, and the presence of a very large, but not to scale, photo representation to show us what the velorio would look like uh, and invite people to go to San Juan to see it. Well, this has been an honor to have this conversation with all of you about, about Oyer. I, it's been it's an a, honor for us to be in <laughs> such a great And it's, it's great, a beautiful uh, exhibition. Company. I also want everyone to be aware that the Brooklyn Museum is a municipal museum, so please don't let price point be a, a factor in, in dissuading you from going to the show. We can pay as little as a quarter or a dollar. Absolutely. Even though the suggested admission price may be more. If you have a municipal ID, it's absolutely free. So please please come a couple of times and, and bring, bring your, your friends. And children. And children, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. And, yes, thank you. Yeah.